says that we should give people UBI because it'll make them more entrepreneurial, it'll increase innovation, it'll make the economy grow faster, right? And then as uh, Jake pointed out, the impact of that is about upholding the liberal international order. All of that is a set of assumptions, right? Does that make sense so far? And the assumption of fast economic growth being valuable and good and important is a fundamentally capitalist assumption. We're going to unpack what that means uh, in a little while, but it is an assumption that rests upon the idea that we should continue to grow, the economy should continue to grow, right? Is that fair? Next part of a critique is the impact. So just like with a disad, you will read an impact to your link arguments. Uh, unlike a disad, again, these are not causal arguments about the plan necessarily directly <coughs> causing or directly generating a particular set of impacts. Rather, it is saying the system or set of assumptions that we have identified in the 1AC perpetuates a set of impacts. And so the, an impact is a carded argument that explains the implications of those problematic assumptions or those problematic values or the problematic methodology of the 1AC. So for example, uh, again with our capitalism example, uh, we can say that the system of capitalism as a system of economics generates inequality, uh, it causes conflict, it causes environmental destruction, all of these uh, kind of ways that capitalism can be damaging and harmful would be an impact to a link that is about why the uh, one EC is grounded in a capitalist framework. And then the alternative is the third component of a critique, the alternative. So once you have identified a set of harmful assumptions and said here are the things that these harmful assumptions cause or perpetuate, you will want to say, you will want to propose some different assumptions that we could make instead. Right? So it is not all that helpful or useful to say, here's some problematic things that the 1EC assumes without saying we could assume differently, right? So the alternative is the assumptions that the critique would instead make, would make instead of the assumptions of the 1AC. So instead of presuming that the capitalist world order is a good one, we could make socialist assumptions instead. And again, we're going to unpack what all that means in a little bit. Uh, I want to go into a little more depth about each of these parts. So links work usually or often as examples of the choices made by the app or the assumptions behind the choices that are made by the app. So you will often hear link arguments as historical analogies. And I, I find it very helpful to think about link arguments in the following way. So a 1AC is a speech, a speech act. Uh, it is also, it tells a story, right? So for the judge to be interested in voting for the affirmative, they have to kind of buy the story that is being told or the narrative that is being set forth. We had kind of a conversation in our lab yesterday about um, uh, 2AR, you know, and what you're doing in the 2AR and you're telling a story. You're telling a story to the judge about why they should vote for you. And the one I see is what begins that story, right? So link arguments function as analysis of the narrative that has been proposed or the narrative that has been set forward in the 1AC. When we tell stories, there are all kinds of ways to interrogate that story. And when we make link arguments for critiques, it is important that the assumptions that we criticize are significant to the story that is being told. So there are lots of assumptions in the 1AC as we, you know, we just kind of unpacked a few of them. If your critique is about an assumption that is not particularly significant to the construction of the 1AC, it might not be a very strong critique. So if, you know, an assumption that is made by the 1AC uh, might be that, you know, um, when, mm, no, I don't want to use that, that example. I'll come back to that. The point being, assumptions that we criticize should have a, a critical or an important 
grounding within the 1EC. It should not be something tangential. Uh, thinking about impacts is thinking about the kind of world that is created by the set of assumptions put forward by the 1EC. So the kind of society that would exist if we were to continue to make that set of assumptions. And this often deals with the ethics or politics of that society. So is it a good, are we, is it a good or preferable world that we're building when we make the assumptions that go into the 1EC? Does that kind of make sense? And then the alternative is, as I said a minute ago, is a set of different assumptions that would replace the assumptions made by the 1AC. And this, it is important that we not think about a critique alternative as a counterplan, because it is not. <laughs> uh, you know, a counterplan is an alternative policy. A critique alternative is not an alternative policy, though it can include examples of policies that we might endorse if we are to think in a particular way and think differently, but it is not a gap plan. The other difference with some of our kind of policy-based arguments uh, and the off-case positions that you're maybe more familiar with is that it, critiques do not require uniqueness. What do I mean by that? Uh, go ahead. What is happening right now in the status quo has to be changed? Right. That, so that's definitely what I mean by uniqueness, is the state of the world and the status quo. What does it mean to say that a critique does not need uniqueness? Go ahead. Maybe that doesn't necessarily have to talk about like, what's going on in the world right now. Sure, yeah. But why? Yeah, go ahead, Pierce. Because it doesn't matter what's happening now. All that matters is what the affirmative assumptions is that they're what they're making. Which means it doesn't matter if capitalism is dying or growing now. If the affirmative is, is suggesting the capitalist assumptions, then it links to the, uh, to the K. Yeah, good. So the, the set of claims being made by a critique does not rely upon, like I said earlier, does not rely upon a set of causal claims, right? It is not that the plan causes something specific to happen. It is about the assumptions behind the 1AC. If we have problematized those assumptions, it is sort of irrelevant to say, well, those assumptions are being made now. Like, that is true in m most cases, but that does not speak to the question of whether we ought to make those assumptions. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So why does this matter? Um, I want to think about just kind of like what we're, what we're doing here, what we're talking about here. So assumptions, values, and methods all influence the way that policies get implemented. So for example, um, most of you would not, actually I don't think any of you would have debated this topic, but a few years ago in high school we had a criminal justice reform topic. Oh, Jake, did you debate it? You nodded heavily. Oh, nice, okay. I'll debate Okay, well, <laughs> our extreme nerds have debated this topic. Good job, y'all. <laughs> so um, in the context of criminal justice reform, there's a sort of weird confluence of different ideological um, presumptions behind the motivations for uh, reforming our criminal justice system. So there is a bunch of people uh, who correctly point out that our uh, criminal justice system is racist, uh, it has disproportionate effects on marginalized folks, uh, and is you know messed up in a whole bunch of ways. So a bunch of people, there's many people who advocate reform to the criminal justice system on those premises, or for those reasons. That makes sense? There are also people who think that we should reform the criminal justice system because it is really expensive to lock people up. It like costs a ton of money, it you know make, takes up a bunch of state budgets, uh, and the federal budget too, uh, and it is you know economically inefficient. How do you think that the diff those two perspectives might differently influence the way that we carry out something like criminal justice reform. So if I think the criminal justice system as it exists now is super messed up and problematic, and we should reform it, how is that different from saying, we spend too much money locking people up, we should change that? Go ahead, 
Agreed. Uh, yeah. Um, the first one I would say is sort of like a soft like, left argument, and then the second one is like Yeah. So good. We've all identified kind of the differences between those positions. How does the how do those assumptions or premises how might they influence the way that we do reform and the way it gets carried out? I think Zoe spoke to this a little bit, but I want to kind of unpack it more. Jake. Um, I think the first one is saying that the way that we like observe the system and like how we think about um, like criminal justice reform is problematic, and that's what we have to change. While the second one is like we need to change the laws and rules we have around it instead of how we feel about it. So the first one is more like we need to change um, the ideas that like set up the system, and the second one is we just need to change the policies that like put it here in the first place. For sure, yeah, absolutely. And and when we're changing those policies, like both of these sets of assumptions could produce the proposal to um, you know end life without parole, right? How might the how might the ensuing policies be different based on those two different ways of approaching it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's right on. So, um, you know, people at, at various people have spoken to this sort of differently, but um, the potentially, if we're thinking about the criminal justice system from the perspective of the ways in which it disproportionately harms people of color and other marginalized individuals, we might think about a shift in how we approach those problems in the first place. We might propose a different set of policies that uh, get at those issues, right, and start to shift the way that we approach, uh, you know, punishment in this society. The second perspective, the one that says, like, it is economically inefficient that we lock people up for their entire lives and it costs a bunch of money and we have to, like, hire all these people, like, guards and all that stuff, and that is economically problematic. The policies that could result from those presumptions or those premises could look pretty different, right? Because you could end life without parole and fundamentally not change anything about the way that the society operates or the way that we approach questions of punishment, right? The, the whole criminal justice system could stay pretty racist and we could still achieve the ends that we're looking for by trying to uh, make it more cost effective. Is that tracking a little bit? So the assumptions that go into policies influence the way that they are carried out. So on this topic, similar example, there is one way of approaching economic inequality, which is to say it is fundamentally unjust. It is, you know, bad for people to uh, have, you know, for wealthy people to have all of the assets in the country and for some people to have nothing at all. And that is fundamentally, and, you know, all of the knock-on effects of everything in between, and that has fundamentally unjust, that is an unjust thing. Um, or, you know, we could say that economic fiscal redistribution makes our society more, again, economically efficient, right? We could say that re fiscal redistribution, as in the case of UBI, of the, this UBI 1AC, uh, you know, better facilitates the market, better facilitates people uh, starting new companies and creating jobs and makes the market function more efficiently. 
Does everyone see how those are pretty different place starting points? So the example for this topic might be there is you know, one set of perspectives that says economic inequality is unjust. It says that it is bad for people, uh, for some people to have a lot of money and some people to have no money. Uh, and that has a whole, you know, that is fundamentally problematic. There's a second set of perspectives that could be, you know, the economic efficiency of the current system is not working very well. Uh, and we need to do fiscal redistribution to increase the efficiency of the way our market economy works. Do you see the difference? And do you see how those might produce different policy proposals? Okay. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some different types of critiques, um, and this is not close to an exhaustive list, nor is it uh, really, nor nor is it necessarily a set of categories that necessarily covers everything that you could debate. But um, I did, you know, some like I read some like old articles about critiques to prepare for this lecture, and uh, an early typology that gets cited a lot is this um, article by Bennett in 1996, who says that the three kind of broad categories of critiques are thinking critiques. So a lot of what we've talked about so far in this lecture involves looking at the presuppositions and assumptions about rules, frameworks, structures, and systems of thought. Has anyone in here debated a security critique before? What does a security critique say? Um, I don't know your name, but. Okay, I did it once, so it might not be last, but from what I understand, it's basically saying that like, when you, when, you, uh, when, you, when you believe that the threat exists, and like, you, even if the foreign actor hasn't done anything yet, it puts the idea in their mind, like it, it enforces the possibility that that threat very well can happen, <laughs> therefore you cause your own impact to happen. Like, you guarantee your own impact to happen to some extent. Yeah. That idea is referred to as threat construction. So when you um, construct or depict certain ideologies or certain um, you know, kind of systems or certain things that are happening as threats, they become, in fact, real threats. Yeah, I mean. Like, when you villainize other countries, or like, um, not even countries, but like governments or like enemies, um, that builds the, that makes them more of an enemy. So even if they would like be like not like not an enemy at all, but like even if you have like a little rivalry or like I don't know like beef with them, it's like when you think about like when you make it to the like when you project a flat when you, words are hard. When you project that like to other people in your country, it makes it more true. Yeah, absolutely. Enemy kind of enemy creation yeah. kind of idea. So a, a security critique uh, generally suggests that the um, impacts put forward by a particular 1AC are constructed and the way that we approach the world to say that you know we need to do a set of policies because they avert you know war between the US and China that that constructs China as an enemy it depicts China as a threat uh, and that that is what actually causes kind of impacts to happen rather than averting them. So that is a, that's a pretty oversimplified, but that's a security critique, an example of the thinking critique. Second category is language critiques, which criticize particular uses of language in the 1AC as problematic. Uh, and a pretty common, well, I don't, you don't actually see this that much anymore, but um, the a kind of, <coughs> Paradigmatic early example of a language critique is a gendered language critique, which says that when you use the masculine as the kind of universal subject, that that perpetuates patriarchy. Who knows what I mean by patriarchy? Uh, yes. A male-dominated like society. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so when we presume that the masculine is the universal subject, we perpetuate or further systems of nature. And so a language critique in this vein would identify examples of gender language within the 1AC and say that is problematic and we should not use language in that way. 
And then value critiques are critiques that challenge the premises or expose contradictions at ethical levels. So these are deontological critiques. Does anyone know what deontology is? Um, yes. Oh, you're, maybe you're not raising your hand. <laughs> For sure. Uh, Pierce. Deontology is the ethical belief that actions are good, whether or not like the act of like doing them is good. So it's not about the results that matter, but it's about the act itself. Yeah. So deontology is the idea of kind of you know making decisions and taking actions for a priori ethical considerations rather than for consequentialist reasons. And so val a value critique might say the app is unethical for fo the following reason, reject it. Um, so like I said, this is kind of an early typology, doesn't really cover a lot of stuff. The examples that I wrote down of kind of more recent uh, evolution in critiques, a lot of critiques incorporate various strands of critical race theory. Uh, who knows what critical race theory is? Other than it's banned in Florida. Alicia. tell them what critical race theory is. <laughs> Wait, actually. No one raised their hand. Oh, Serena? Uh, yeah, good example, for sure. Broadly speaking, what are we referring to when we say critical race theory? Mm -hmm. Well, I looked it up. And it's <laughs> critical race theory is a cross-disciplinary examination by social and, civil, social and civil rights scholars and activists of how laws, social and political movements, and media safe are safe by social conceptions of race and ethnicity. For sure. Anyone want to put that in their own words? Elias. That, like, I guess society itself is uh, systemically racist and there's, like, institutional barriers within society and that idea as being one or at least uh, one of <coughs> very controversial, controversial when it comes to education. Yeah, true. Go ahead. Basically, like, systematic racism has been so ingrained in institutions that there has to be, like, that's why, like, affirmative action has to be a thing because, like, people are so, like, they say, like, just like the way of thinking, even though we think people have evolved, they still think that the gap is. So That's like, true. It's like, like, even if you go to like a court or something like that, like, um, uh, what's it called? It's just like everything in court and stuff, like everything just in rain, like, systematically is definitive in our institutions. Yeah, definitely. All, all of that is absolutely part of the set of, um, you know, theories and ideas that compose critical race theory, which is a pretty broad category. Um, but hopefully, can we all see how, you know, the precepts of a critical race theory might inform a critique that we could read and debate? Yes, go ahead. I think critique is spelled differently here. So, good point. Um, great, great point. Uh, so the, the word critique, spelled C-R-I-T-I-Q-U-E, is kind of a, is a term that's been used in academia you know, for a long time to refer to uh, you know, an argument about another argument. Uh, I have a critique of your argument that says that it is wrong or flawed or problematic in the following ways. When critiques were introduced to debate, um, you know, some of the practitioners and people who were kind of introducing these ideas spelled it with a K for reasons that I don't super remember. I don't know if Maggie does. It's just, it's like the German spelling. And so a lot of critiques came out of Germany. And so the Americans who were writing about uh, the German critique authors started spelling with a K. And I use them interchangeably based on, I don't know, the like weather or whatever. Um, <laughs> And most, I think that's true generally. Like, it, it does not mean something different. Mm -mm. It's the same thing. Same thing. Oh, uh, well, could there be technically two different meanings, though? Because, like, a critique in, in the way you critique the AF's assumptions, and a critique in which the Zuz talks about how you debate it at the very end. Oh, sure. The word critique is also used in the context of a judge's decision. That's true. Like, an oral critique is how we talk about judges' feedback. So that is confusing. Um, but they, we can, we that is a good reason, perhaps, if you're looking for one to spell it with a K when you're talking about the debate argument. So there you go. The critique or critique. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
A lot of critiques and critiques. Uh, okay. Uh, and then the other kind of modern innovation or and other modern innovation on critiques and debate is critiques of debate itself. Uh, critiques that say that debate um, as an activity and as an institution is fundamentally problematic and you know we should you should not presume that the kind of structures and assumptions that go into a typical uh, debate round are good. They are not neutral. They should be problematized. We are going to talk a little bit about some terms that will be useful to know for debating critiques uh, because they are some of the foundational kind of concepts that we use and employ when we are thinking about critical arguments. So the first is epistemology. Epistemology po fundamentally poses the question, how do we come to know? So it is the branch of metaphysics that deals with the study of knowledge. For example, um, can anyone tell me what empiricism is? Uh, usually, when we say empirical examples, that's what we mean, but empiricism as a concept. Learning from the past? Uh, yeah, basically, the, the study, uh, empiricism is kind of a system of uh, thought that is like when we can study things and demonstrate that they've happened, like the scientific method is an empirically grounded or an, a, a form of empiricism. We know what the scientific method is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we say that the scientific method works, that is an epistemological claim. Is that fair? Is it about how we know things? Second is ontology, which asks the question, how do we come to be in the world, or the branch of metaphysics that deals with uh, being. <coughs> An ontological claim is one about the fundamental ways that we exist in the world. So the existence or non-existence of God is like the paradigmatic ontological question. Rhetoric can pose the question, how do we construct the world through language? So a rhetorical analysis is one that looks at what words are used to depict the world and what kind of world is constructed by that use of language. Relatedly, discourse kind of asks the question, how do we frame and portray the world? So a discursive analysis is one that says, when we, what we choose to include and exclude from our descriptions of the world fundamentally tells us a lot about, about the things that we're saying. And then methodology asks the question, how do we study the world? All those terms making sense? And all of these terms, you know, they're relevant and important because they can inform different varieties or link arguments of critiques. We're going to do some more glossary stuff in a little bit, um, but I wanted to get those out there because they're like foundational um, philosophical critical literature terms. Yes? So, like, you know how I help, like, like how we came to debate. Yep. So then, like, since anthropology is like the study of like humans and how they came to debate. Right. So it's like that basically is like the more like general term, and like, like anthropology is specifically like focusing on humans. Um, um, that is a very interesting question. I don't know how I would describe the relationship between ontology and anthropology, if I'm being honest with you, but um, I do like anthropology. 
I would say encompasses, as a field of study, it encompasses, you know, different methodologies or ways of studying the world and different epistemologies or ways of knowing in the world. Um, yeah, I don't, it, how does that relate to ontology? Anthropologists probably have, I don't know a lot about anthropology, they, anthropologists most likely have particular ontological assumptions that form the basis of their work. I don't know what an example of those assumptions would be, but you're definitely right that it is relevant. Maybe hold on to that one and ask like Nick or something. Um, okay, other questions so far? Okay, how to read and go for a critique. So we have some background in what we're talking about, what is a critique, what are we doing here, um, when you make these arguments in debates. A couple of things that I want you to think about. One is, it is very important to understand the theoretical foundations of the argument that you're making. So that is why we're going to spend a bunch of time today unpacking the concepts behind the capitalism critique, because if you're going to read the capitalism critique uh, and be able to go for it, you're going to want to understand what you're talking about. And that is important for all debate arguments, but it takes on special significance with critiques because, um, you know, they're a little bit more complicated. They are a little bit off the beaten path in terms of what a layperson might have encountered or understand. And, um, you know, it is, a, it is a place where you don't want to get caught not knowing what you're talking about. So I recommend for any critique that you feel like you want to read and go for often that you do some reading of the kind of foundational texts in the discipline that you're dealing with in the theoretic, the theoretical foundations of that argument. Just do some reading. Read more, read more books. That's my advice for the day. The second um, just kind of basic premise of reading and going for critiques is that it is identical in structure to every other off-case position. So sometimes people, when they read critiques, just feel like the whole debate should look different and they're gonna like read a 15 minute overview and just kind of explain the argument and ignore the line by line. That is not how you wanna do it. A critique is identical in structure to every other off-case position, which is to say, you read the one in C, the block speech or the 2 and C or the 1 and R will answer the 2AC arguments in order, explaining and extending relevant 1 and C evidence and reading additional evidence as you do with other off-case positions. And then you give a 2 and R that kind of distills all of that and answers the 1 and R arguments in order. So the structure looks the same. Does that make sense to people? Thinking about uh, reading critiques, broadly speaking, uh, you want to have to diversify your link arguments. So it is easy, or I don't know if it's easy is the wrong word, but it is possible to identify one assumption in the one AC that you take issue with and kind of make that your whole argument. It is probably more strategic and more beneficial to identify a set of assumptions in the one AC and read arguments about those, that set of assumptions. So diversify your link arguments. And you want to make sure that your link arguments, though they can, can be distinct from one another, that they are epistemologically and ideologically compatible. So you don't want to read one argument that says, um, here's an assumption in the 1AC that is you know, capitalist, and then another that says, here's an assumption in the 1AC that is socialist, and say that, you know, that's our critique, as those two things don't fit together very well. Second broad concept here is to understand how your alternative solves the links and impacts that you've identified. So be able to explain what it is that your alternative presumes differently and why presuming that, presuming differently in that way overcomes the problems that you've outlined. And then on the impact level, there's a couple of kind of terms that are useful to know and ways of thinking about the impact um, that are useful to know. So to take a step back for a second, 
uh, a common refrain and like a common response to a critique is like, well, we in the 1AC outlined three scenarios for nuclear war and extinction, and your critique says that like, you know, it is violent to presume in a to think in a particular way and causes kind of like low level violence. Well, our, we said extinction and you said your thing and our thing outweighs, right? So very common refrain from the app is extinction outweighs the critique. Ways of dealing with this for the negative often include or center around turns the case argument. So what do I mean by turns the case? Zoe. Um, basically, like, the all the solves the impact, so I guess this is going to be like five and like three social solutions to somehow solve like declining economic growth. So that is one way for sure of dealing with 1AC impacts is to say the alternative solves them. I want to get at something a little bit different when I say turns the case. Anyone have an idea what I mean by turns the case? Zoe? Uh, yeah, so broadly speaking, just the argument that the critique impacts interact with the impacts to the 1AC. The, whether it's that the critique impacts cause the impacts isolated by the 1AC or encompass those impacts, etc. But ways of accessing 1AC impacts through the critique. And there's a couple of ways of doing this in the examples that I wrote down. One is uh, an idea called serial policy failure. And serial policy failure refers to the idea that when we make flawed assumptions in our policy making, our, the resulting policies themselves will be flawed and will fail to achieve the ends that they're designed to achieve. So when we think in ways that are problematic, the policies that we then implement as a result of that set of thoughts is wrong or is bad or is in, insufficient and thus does not solve the things that we're trying to achieve. The second example of this kind of impact argument can be uh, root cause, which is to say we have identified a structure or a system of thought or a paradigm that underlies or generates the impacts that you have identified. So we have, we have, you have identified what is called a proximate cause of your impacts or a near a set of events that could trigger your impact. We have identified the underlying assumptions that perpetuate those impacts. Is that making sense? I'm getting a lot of, okay. We'll talk about an example in a little bit. But that is an impact-related re argument that can be useful uh, when you're reading a critique. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, decision-making when the, the judge's kind of decision-making process when evaluating a critique. So I, you know, we alluded to this earlier on, but critiques change, generally speaking, change the decision-making paradigm from one that is a pure policy making focus to one that considers other things instead. So critiques introduce a different set of considerations in judging the debate that does not rely just on is the plan a good idea or not. The default assumption in policy debate, and we talked about this earlier, is policy making and the sort of baseline for most, for many debates that you have had would be that the judge is deciding whether the plan is better or worse than either the status quo, the way things are now, or a different policy, like a counterpoint. And critiques say, that is not the question you should be asking as the judge. You should be asking different questions about the validity, utility, and ethics of the 1AC, rather than are the consequential impacts that are averted, you know, important enough. And so this means that critiques often say that their argument presents 
prior considerations that need to be accounted for or need to be considered before the judge decides is the plan a good idea or not. And this is often referred to as a framework argument or a roll of the ballot argument. So it is not something that I listed on the parts of a critique because it's not necessarily uh, a component of every critique, but it often is. And we'll talk a little bit about how those debates kind of play out um, in a little bit. Uh, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna switch gears and think about what happens when we're at. So the negative has presented a series of arguments that say that the 1EC is flawed or problematic, what do we do? Well, the most important kind of takeaway and what I would want you to always be thinking about when you're answering a critique is that you want to defend your assumptions. So if, the, if a critique problematizes or challenges the assumptions, methods, and or values of the 1EC, the first and most important step for answering a critique is defending those assumptions, methods, and or values. Does that seem fair? So you want to defend your assumptions. And that requires thinking about what goes into your 1AC and what those presumptions are and thinking about how you might defend them. So I would want to make sure that anytime you read a 1AC that you have a robust defense of the core premises that go into constructing that one. Now, broadly speaking, there's kind of two strategic approaches to debating critiques. One is to say our assumptions are correct, the critique assumptions are wrong, and we think the critique assumptions are bad. And that is a way of approaching the critique that we think of as impact turning. So we are right, you are wrong. Your assumptions are silly, our assumptions are correct. The second strategic approach is a little bit more moderate in, insofar as it is not saying the critique is actively bad or wrong. It is, say, it is to say that the case is still a good idea that we can have the assumptions that the 1AC has and the assumptions of the critique, and that that is better than the alternative assumptions proposed, or in other words, a permutation. What do you think you want to have, need, want or need to have? So, if your approach to a critique is permutation focused and saying we should. Hold on to the assumptions that we see, but we can also incorporate the alternative assumptions suggested here. What is important to incorporate as part of that strategy? Like, what do you think you need to win in order to win? We should do both of these. We should assume both of these assumptions. Yeah. Yeah, so you want to have some defense of your own assumption for sure, which circles back to the first thing. That's very important. Um, and then I would say that the other important component of this is to win that the alternative assumptions don't work very well on their own. So alternative solvency-based arguments. In thinking about these two different approaches to critiques, um, you want to consider how your 1AC interacts with the critique arguments. So you do not want to uh, kind of go into this and say, like, oh, well, just impact turn this critique because I think that's cool. You want to have thought about what are the impact turn arguments, how do they interact with the assumptions made by this critique, how, how are we going to approach this? The categories of argument that you want to make in every 2AC to a critique are as follows. So first, we know, you know, from this conversation and from our experiences, that the negative is likely to propose an alternative paradigm for evaluation or an alternative framework. 
the two, it is helpful for the 2EC to have a defense of a policy-making framework or the consideration of the plan's effects in comparison to the status quo or a different policy. So that is a framework argument that says, when you make your decision, you should consider whether, plan, whether the F is a good idea or not. The second argument you want to include in a 2AC2 a critique is a per, at least one permutation. So we just talked about this a little bit, but fundamentally when we're talking about critiques, what do I mean by a permutation? Yeah, absolutely. So we can combine our assumptions with the assumptions put forward by the alternative, and that would have a net positive result. The, and, and like you said, it is to say that the, our assumption is not mutually exclusive with what the alternative forwards, right? So you said to always have at least one Yes. Mm -hmm. Just throw it out there to see if it's Yeah, in part, like in part it's throwing it out there. In part it's covering your bases. In part it's often critique, many critiques struggle with permutations because they like a, a strength of a critique is that it is really good at identifying problematic assumptions. A weakness is like proving that the assumptions that you have said would be better are actually mutually exclusive with what the 1AC has said. Um, and then also, like I said, it can be a foundational strategy for the AF in the final rebuttals to say we should do both. And so that, you know, set yourself up for the option of that strategy. Does that make sense? Third argument that you want to have in the 2AC against a critique is offense and defense against the alternative. So it's very important that you answer the alternative in the 2AC. We want to have both offensive reasons that the alternative would be a bad set of assumptions to incorporate and defensive reasons that the alternative assumptions forwarded would not be very effective. So alternative solvency takeouts and alternative offense. Fourth, and similar to other arguments that you encounter in debate, we want to have impact defense that says the impacts that are identified to these problematic assumptions are not that bad. So impact defense. And then the final category of argument um, that is useful to have in the 2AC um, and that might be implicit in some of the other stuff that you're saying uh, is the argument that the case outweighs. And we kind of alluded to this earlier that, you know, that here are the reasons that the case, the impacts of the case are worse than the impacts identified to this criticism. Okay. Do people have questions about what we've covered so far? Because we've talked in pretty general terms. Uh, we are going to talk in more specific terms for the last bit. Uh, but I want to see what questions people have at this stage. Do you have a question, Plenary? Okay. Serena. Sure. So the framework on the negative with a critique is the argument that the judge needs to take a different set of considerations into account when evaluating the debate besides is the plan a good idea or not. And that can take some different forms depending on the critique and kind of its assumptions, um, but it generally, generally speaking, shifts the paradigm for evaluating the debate from a policy-focused, plan-focused model to one that would evaluate the 1AC more holistically. Other questions? I was answering this question, which was, 
run back through framework and I said um, that the frame, a framework argument on the negative with a critique shifts the paradigm from one that is plan focused to one that would evaluate the one you see more holistically. <laughs> Isn't holistic what? In a holistic way. When you say something like holistic. Oh, oh herbs, yeah. Herbs. Right, it means think about the herbs that we should use to solve all our problems. No, um, no, holistically just means as a whole. So like it means evaluating the whole spectrum of considerations of the 1AC as an object rather than the plan is the singular focus and is the most important thing. Does that make sense? On the neg or the F? So for the neg, uh, there can be a variety of different warrants for why the decision making model should look uh, a different way. And usually these have, often these have to do with kind of to get at something that you said, the ethical considerations behind our decisions. Um, sometimes they have to do with the importance of language and how language shapes our policies and shapes reality. Um, sometimes it has to do with ontology and, and we need to consider our, the ontological foundations of an argument before we can decide whether it is a good or a bad idea. So the warrants really vary based on what kind of critique you're reading and what the premises are that you're forwarding. But generally speaking, they will say plan focus as a decision making model uh, forecloses our ability and our opportunity to analyze and research and consider important things that go into those considerations. Does that make sense? And then on the F, the F is going to say primarily that it is super mean of the NAG to forward an argument that is about, that is not about the plan, that the F you know, showed up prepared to debate whether the plan is a good idea, and for you to shift the framework to something else is unfair. Uh, wouldn't that be like, um, you're talking, like, so let's say, like, you're talking about how the word or something like that, and, like, let's say, like, um, the app is, like, very, like, hyper-focused on, like, extinction to the nuclear war, mm -hmm. but then, like, the, uh, like, the, like, and then, but then, like, you, you'd be like, there's like a slight probability, but we should, like, then you'd be talking about more like ethical implications, we'd be talking about like societal issues and like systematic stuff instead of that, just because you'd like to do like hyper focus on something that has a very low probability. Yeah, so I think that what you're getting at is more of an impact comparison argument that's like, we should think about yes. impacts in terms of their likelihood of happening rather than their magnitude, which is definitely a version of an argument that you will hear with many critiques. That's like, you know, F impacts are these like shiny, big nuclear wars that are super scary or whatever, but that deprioritizes impacts that are more likely that are actually happening. That is an impact framing argument uh, that you do often hear with critiques, but it is not a framework argument because it is about how we compare impacts, not how we think about the debate as a whole. Does that distinction make oh, sense? Oh, yes, yeah, so they see like, you are more clear when you're talking about it more as a whole, because right? like, like, it's kind of your change for a lot of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Other questions? Okay, we are going to talk about the capitalism critique, which is the critique that you will debate um, here at the ND and likely beyond. So the thesis of any capitalism critique is that the AF makes assumptions that are fundamentally capitalist in nature. And we'll talk in a second about exactly what that means. The critique then, the capitalism critique then says that the, the, those capitalist assumptions underlie a whole host of problems. Capitalism produces inequality, uh, it causes conflict, uh, it makes people's lives materially worse, uh, and it harms the environment, for example. And then this critique says we should make different assumptions instead, and the version that you're going to debate here says we should make socialist assumptions instead. Mm -hmm. 
And we're going to talk about what each of those things mean. So, sure. I'll also send this out so you don't have to take pictures of every single slide, but it'll be a cool album on your phone, though. Okay. So, glossary of terms that you will need to know. Capitalism. Capitalism is a system of economics characterized by the free exchange of goods and services in which prices of goods and services are determined by the market. We live in a capitalist economy. Tracking so far. By contrast, socialism is a system of economics in which the means of production, distribution, and exchange are governed or regulated by the community as a whole. Does everyone see the difference between those two systems? By what? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, by the market. Right. Exactly. Um, so Canada is also a capitalist economy, but it has socialist. Right. There's there's some socialist elements to the way um, Canada is structured. Uh, like you're referring to, universal health care is absolutely within the spectrum of policies that would be endorsed by a socialist model. Good. Questions about those so far? Uh, bourgeoisie is another term that you encounter in this literature. Uh, it, bourgeois or bourgeoisie refers to the class that owns most of society's wealth and controls the means of production. Yeah? Uh, it could be. Uh, an oligarch definitely falls within the bourgeois class for sure. Uh, commodification. Commodification refers to the transformation or uh, way of looking at things such as goods, services, ideas, information, people as goods to be bought and sold, objects of trade, or in terms of their economic value. So instead of seeing things in the world for their intrinsic worth, we see things as for their economic value and what they can be bought and sold for. And then proletariat is kind of the counterpart to the bourgeoisie, refers to the working class or people within the working class. We good on these concepts? Okay. So the capitalism critique forwards the premise that the AF is fundamentally capitalist and that is bad. How might we go about answering the capitalism critique here at camp? Well, we have kind of two avenues. Does anyone remember the two strategic approaches that we talked about to answering critiques, the two kind of models of ways to, to deal with them? David. Uh, you can impact them. Mm -hmm. Or? Or you can do a permanent all cells to take them. Good. So those are our two strategic options, right? We could say capitalism is good and socialism is bad. Or we can say socialism is compatible with the assumptions in the 1AC and UBI has some like socialist 
flavors to it. So fundamentally that is in the direction of a socialist assumption. What do I, what does it mean to say that UBI ha has some like socialist overtones or like could be an example of a socialist policy? Someone maybe who hasn't talked to, yeah? Yeah, go ahead. Say more. Yeah, so it's the provision of an income, uh, it is the universal pr provision of money that goes to everyone. And why is that in line with a socialist assumption? If we go back to our definition of socialism. A lot. From like a, dis from like a distribution standpoint, uh, wealth is being distributed equally through UBI and in socialism, like the means of distribution is like exchanged and governed by the people. So it's in a sense it's being collected from the people but then being distributed in equal fashion. And, like you could say that there are uh, like people who like uh, bourgeoisies who are going to be having the majority of that wealth. Yeah, good. So UBI is the provision of a basic income you know, to everyone. It means that we are um, redistributing wealth from you know, the, peop the, the way that the 1EC is set up, this 1EC is set up, the, it redistributes wealth from the wealthiest people who will pay more in taxes uh, to everyone, which means that it is you know, universally provided and establishes a baseline by which everyone can operate and that is that enables kind of the community to govern how income is distributed. So you might say that means that we're going to go for a permutation against the capitalism critique. Or you can say we said that growth is good. We think that growth is facilitated only by capitalist economics. Shifting to a socialist assumption would be problematic. Capitalism is good, socialism is bad. Do those two approaches make sense? What might inform which strategy you choose? Like how are you going to decide whether you're going to impact turn or go for the firm? David? Uh, I have a really good cap file. Okay, for sure. Uh, Rochelle. Based on like how well the neck responds to both arguments and the law. Okay, yeah, you might make that decision on a case by case basis, uh, depending on how the debate plays out. I think that's definitely true. You have the materials for both of these strategies in your in the evidence set that you'll get today, um, so they are definitely both options to you. Um, it is important to note that those two approaches are not fundamentally compatible with one another and cannot both be in the 2AR. So the 2AR cannot both be UBI is kind of socialist, so perm, but also capitalism is good. Why not? Yeah? Because then you kind of like double turn yourself because you're not accessing a good thing. Kind of, yeah. You're, um, yeah. It, it, the question of whether that is a complete double turn, I think, is an interesting one. Um, but either way, it, they are not compatible. Okay. We are at the questions portion, which I thought that there would be a lot more questions on the way, so we have a lot of time to answer questions. And you're not going anywhere until you ask me questions, so don't get excited. Yeah? So how exactly do you come up there? You would say that the assumptions forwarded by the alternative are compatible with the assumptions made by the 1AC. And you would then explain the way in which they are compatible, or what it would mean to hold both assumptions at the same time. So like, how does that work with capitalism? So with the capitalism critique, you would say, like, kind of what I was referring to 
we're talking about with UBI is to say that the plan is like a step in the direction of a socialist policy because it's a, it allows the distribution of basic income to everyone. Uh, and it says that everyone should have that, which is compatible with your socialist alternative, which says that fundamentally all means of production and distribution of goods should be governed by the community. We are in the direction of that. Does that make sense? That's how you would do that in this context. And then broadly speaking, you would want to figure out how the plan and the 1AC that you have presented is compatible with the set of alternative assumptions presented by the critique. Do you also like, like, do you also like, do you like from the K and then permanent? Yes. So I would use the term no link rather than D link. Uh, but that is actually a very important part of a permutation strategy is saying that the link arguments are incorrect. Great question. Yes? Um, so Sorry, I can't hear you. Can you speak up a little? I was saying earlier when we were talking about breaking the clock down. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep going. Okay. Yep. <laughs> That's great. We love that. Um, yeah, the, the impacts are often about what is the type of world that is constructed or created by the assumptions that are put forward by the 1AC. So the impacts to the capitalism critique are about what are the problems created by a world in which we make capitalist assumptions and valorize the system of capitalism as an economic system. Yeah? Um, what are the framework arguments we're going to be getting? Sorry, say that again. What are the framework arguments that we're going to be getting in the market? Um, I, Alicia will have to answer the like specific way that the framework blocks are written. Deliberately, we did not like write super extensive framework blocks because we want you all to be thinking about these questions. Um, but, you know, the file does include a like little framework thing that's like we should think about the way that we approach the world before we consider our, the implications to our actions. And will we be able to write other framework arguments? Or is it, it is fine for you to rewrite the way that that argument is explained. Okay. Other questions? Um, generally speaking, yes. So, thinking about how much I want to say here, the best critiques, in my opinion, are grounded very strongly in the 1AC. That does not mean that every critique that you will debate has a strong relationship to the 1AC. In my opinion, the further that a critique gets from talking about anything the 1AC says, the better your framework argument is in the 2AC when you're like, hey, we presented this policy proposal and you shifted the focus of the debate to something pretty irrelevant to that, like that sucks. That, in my opinion, strengthens the framework argument. Um, but it is, it is a style of critique that you will sometimes hear that is like wholly unrelated to the 1AC. So, good question. And I guess that's not totally fair because even critiques that seem wholly unrelated to the 1AC will assume, will be based on something that the 1AC does assume, even if it is not a central consideration. Like assuming that it is good to save people's lives is a basic assumption of most 1ACs. That is something you could criticize. It would be you know, arguably shifts the focus of the debate, but that's a conversation to have. Yeah? Yeah, so remember when I said that um, the structure of a critique is the same as other off-case positions? So it's the same thing where you go through the 2AC arguments and in answering them, you will explain the concepts of the critique. 
So you will not need to, like, you know, Nick is going to tell you never ever give an overview. Other coaches that you'll have will be like, you must give an overview. Probably the best approach is somewhere in the middle, but, uh, you know, you'll explain the argument at a minimum, and then you'll answer the arguments uh, in the order presented while articulating what, one and, what the 1 and C had to say about those things. So you'll extend 1 and C evidence as a component of answering what the 2AC says. Good question. Other questions? Keep them going. That, yeah, that is the plan, is to go over the file in, in some more detail um, in lab. But, but if no one has other questions, I will certainly get started on that. Yes, Elias. This is like kind of a broad question, but could a possible like, answer to the cap be that um, you know, like, just normal, that there's no way to like, inherently actually escape the capitalist system because any action to escape the fire is like capitalist action? That is a very common um, argument that you hear on the half to answer capitalism critique is that it is inevitable and inescapable. Absolutely an argument that you can make. Yes? Uh, I don't remember if there's a card on that in this file, but it is an argument you can make either way. Yeah? Great question. Um, so, <laughs> My top level answer to your question is, it's all a debate, it's all debatable. Um, the way I would answer that is to say that the relationship of fiat to a critique alternative is somewhat muddled. So some people are like, critique alternatives don't need fiat, it is not a question of fiat at all. Other people will say, well, an alternative to present the idea that we ought to endorse alternative assumptions requires fiat to say we should, in, like, we ought to endorse those assumptions. And so the way that you conceptualize that, I think, varies a little bit from person to person. It is certainly re reasonable for the negative to say, uh, you know, we think that we should endorse these assumptions and we think if we did, that that would be durable and that that would last. Um, it is also reasonable for the F to say, you know, it is not, in fact, the case that if, you know, the government were to switch gears all of a sudden and become socialist, that that would be a lasting change because there would be a, quite a bit of pushback to that idea, right? And so it is, it is both an argument that the F can make to say your alternative is not durable and something that I can say, yes, it is, but the question of is it durable fiat, I think, is a, a pretty complicated one. Does that make sense? It is less simple than just saying we see out that the app happens and it, you know, that is durable and you don't get to say that it gets well better. There's a little more nuanced. What else you got? Yeah. So when you talk about diversifying like arguments. Are we allowed to make more than one like, argument in the one and C? Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely. And the, the one and C can include multiple link arguments, yes. Okay, but they would have to be carded. Ideally. Okay. I, I think that's a good question. So the question was about whether the one and C can or ought to have more than one link argument. Do those need to have cards? Um, I think that the most common version of a critique that you'll hear is one that kind of crystallizes the link argument to one thing and then explains that. Um, it is certainly possible to make more than one. If you are really certain that you're going for your critique uh, and maybe it's the only thing you put in the one and C, you're probably going to want more than one link argument. Um, and the those ought to be carded because the like link explanation that is like picking lines from one AC evidence and is kind of discussing the concepts behind the one AC, that is usually best done in the block. Good question. What else? 
I have never seen this few questions in a critique lecture before. <laughs> You got questions about other stuff? We're all, it's, we have that Monday morning vibe. Yeah? What's the difference between epistemology and methodology? So epistemology is, the great question. Epistemology is the, um, you know, like I said, about how we come to know. Methodology is about the the like tools and approaches that we use to arrive at those conclusions. So it's like, are you an empiricist? Uh, are you, well, I guess that, that could also be an epistemological question, but like, um, did, does the 1AC to arrive at its claims use the, use like a ground, an approach grounded in um, kind of social science? Does it use, is it a humanistic in inquiry? Just kind of like, what is it that we do to arrive at the conclusions that we arrive at? Does that kind of make sense? So a methodological question might be, your study does not have a large enough sample size. An epistemological question would be, your study is based on flawed epistemological premises. Yeah? So much complex critique you're going to be. Most complex. <clears throat> One example that springs to mind is psychoanalysis. So a psychoanalysis critique says that like we should analyze the world as psychoanalysts. Um, that is pretty complicated. That's for the title of that. Don't know what it means. What? That's for the title of that. Don't know what it means. Mm -hmm, exactly. That's that's my argument. Wait, what was that? What was the topic about? Oh, psychoanalysis could come up on any topic. I mean, what was the topic that the that the critique was for specifically? Uh, any topic. No, well, for that year though. Oh, wait, was it just like a critique you found? Oh, I did not find it. No, psychoanalysis is like a. It is a critique that recurs on every topic because it is about um, like psychic or unconscious drives that lead up, lead us to arrive at certain conclusions. So it is agnostic to what the topic is. Oh wait, so it could work on this one too. Wouldn't Correct. It? Unfortunately. Oh. Yeah. Is it people make serial policy failure arguments on the cap case? Yes, absolutely. Um, so they say that capitalist um, assumptions, you know, mean that we are driven by the profit motive, the drive to make more money and accumulate more wealth, uh, which produces a set of policies that are fundamentally flawed and that make, you know, that drive, for example, inequality, so perpetuate the impacts that you have identified to the AF, uh, and that are, you know, doomed to fail because they will perpetuate those problems. Absolutely. What else? Okay, I'm going to pull up the capitalism critique file and we're going to start reading it. Okay, let's all read this card together. Basic income is the band-aid that legitimizes neoliberal capitalism and allows market priorities to continue unchallenged. McDowell in 21. Basic income could soften some of the impacts of the market's contradictions while at the same time stabilizing the hegemonic order. The fragmenting of the progressive neoliberal hegemonic bloc in the mid-2010s has created a moment of instability and transition that also provides opportunities for new ruling co coalitions to form. A critical understanding of the historical contradictions that have brought about neoliberalism's legitimation, legitimization crisis then can help explain why basic income, given its ability to address some of these specific issues, while at the same time securing and extending free market relations, has emerged as a popular policy response to rising inequality while preserving an order devoted to competitive market principles in an increasingly unstable political climate. The state's primary objective is to reestablish equilibrium to consolidate the authority of the hegemonic system. Basic income may provide the best possible shell for revitalized neoliberalism, offering stability to the existing order. A basic income developed by and for a neoliberal environment is likely to bear the hallmarks of its strategic imperatives to promote an agenda that places primary emphasis on market competition and the profit margins of private capital. This could lead to the development of a neoliberalized guaranteed income scheme that seeks to replace existing welfare supports. Friedman noted that one of the benefits of a guaranteed income scheme is that it weakens the foundations 
of the welfare state since it will provide citizens with reasoned alternatives to present programs that will permit a gradual withdrawal from them. Neoliberalism has proven adept at reconstituting itself to accommodate variegated and complex environments, making short-term concessions to ensure the consolidation of its hegemony. Basic income is uniquely positioned as a policy approach that corresponds sufficiently to both the political demands of the present moment and to the essential logic of the neoliberal intellectual tradition to temporarily stabilize the political order. What do you all get from that? Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah. Um, I like the driven by like um, uh, unethical like motives, such as trying to get the most money and feeding the class by like having to do these things. Yeah, absolutely. What does it have to say about basic income? No, I'm not answering the question. I'm just wondering <laughs> if you can send it. I'm just like visual. Email. We'll we'll do that in lab. Um, just try to try to process as much as you can from here. Yeah, so it's like UBI sustains the like system of capitalism by reinforcing the markets and ensuring the like, economic growth. Good. And how does it? What is the reason or explanation for how basic income kind of achieves that? Uh, what? Well, um, I heard a part about like profit-driven um, policy and how like um, sort of like the just how like the principles itself of like the capital system are endured in the UBI and that the methods of I guess maybe collection perhaps are like uh, capitalist driven. Okay, um, and specifically, what does what is the suggestion? Does it, did anyone catch kind of the argument about? how basic income functions to kind of appease people. I don't think that's the word that was used. Did anyone catch anything about that? Yeah? I'm not 100% sure, but I think you said like, like suppresses them. Kind of, yeah. So the part that's like, A critical understanding of the historical contradictions that have brought about neoliberalism's legitimation crisis can help to explain why basic income, given its ability to address some of these specific issues while at the same time securing and extending free market relations, has emerged as a popular policy response. So that there are particular issues that can be mollified or can be smoothed over by providing a basic income, while at the same time, as Zoe said, propping up neoliberalism. Does that kind of make sense? Um, there was something else I want to say about this. Oh, the other argument that this card makes that I like a lot is that uh, a, mm, where is this line? I can't remember the line, but it's, it makes the argument that a universal basic income that is developed and implemented within a neoliberal system will still be neoliberal. In, rather than, which is kind of a, you know, getting out in front of the argument that's like, oh, but it's a basic income, a universal basic income, so it's like, it's so nice to everyone, it's so socialist. It's like, no, when you do that from neoliberal assumptions and with neoliberal structures, that is still neoliberal, which is a term that we did not cover because I forgot. Who knows what neoliberal means? David. Like, really pro, biz, big business, pro, pro completely non regulation pro business. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Or I'm pretty sure like, like there's not really much regulation. Everything's like commercialized or uh, Yeah, commercialized. Commercial yeah, I think it's a that's one I'm pretty sure it means like democratic, like in terms of the liberal order, I think neo like that was one of our impacts. I'd say neoliberalism would be something relating to democracy. Good. So all of you are correct. So the, you know, the way that people often talk about this, capitalism is like a fundamental economic system that has evolved over time into a neoliberal order, which um, you're right, the, it, is, it refers not only to the system of economics, but also the system of government. Um, and so a democratic capitalist system, people refer to often as being, you know, a as being the neoliberal version. Neo means new, 
liberal means, you know, what liberal means. The new version of, you know, a liberal society that validates or valorizes, you know, individualism and free markets, etc. Okay. I'm going to scroll, but I'm going to read a different version of what's up here. Capitalism fuels a laundry list of impacts. Catastrophic environmental degradation, war, and violent police states are all driven by the system. Robinson, 14. The causal origins of the global crisis found in overaccumulation and contradictions of the capitalist system. The system cannot assure the survival of a majority of humanity. Uh, states face crises of legitimacy, a crisis of sustainability expressed in climate change, collapse of agricultural systems, systemic specter of collapse of world civilization. Capitalism threatens the sixth mass extinction. These processes have already crossed their planetary boundaries, changed warfare, normalized and sanitized aggression. A planet of slums of social control includes prison, complexes, policing, gentrification. The militarization of social life makes it hard to imagine the system under any political authority. What do we get out of that? What is that card trying to communicate? Yeah, yeah, big time. Good. Any examples of some of the things that this card says capitalism perpetuates? Yeah, David. Computerized war, bunker buster bombs, Star Wars. Um, Good. Uh, impact claim making sense. How does capitalism drive those things? Go ahead, Elias. In a neoliberal system, there's like very little regulation, so like the free market sort of strips and strips the profitability. Like it can't solve issues like climate change. Yeah, good. So profit motive corrupts the policies that we implement. Uh, it means that we systematically destroy the environment because we're so interested in making more money. Um, and all of those other things that David outlined are the result of a capitalist framework or a neoliberal system that um, prioritizes <clears throat> profit over people. Okay. Vote negative to endorse socialist revolution. Only total overthrow and replacement of capitalism can solve. Allen 17. Socialism can be attained by forcible overthrow of all existing conditions. The state could not be used because it has been shaped by the dominant class. Workers need direct political power to liberate themselves. Uprooting exploitation is required political force in revolution that clarify their own interests and develop a different society. This cannot change through preaching. Struggle is the only way people learn. Revolution is necessary because the ruling class cannot be overthrown in any other way. It is only when society has reached a massive impasse that it adopts revolutionary methods to achieve these moderate demands. What do you get out of that? Mm -hmm. In order for workers to, um, I guess, reach their goals, they have to start a socialist revolution. Absolutely. Anyone else have anything to add to that? So how would you, if asked in cross-examination, describe this alternative? If someone was like, I don't really get your alternative, what, what's your deal? Zoe. It like, brings together these different like, workers' movements and socialist movements and sort of like, them against the state and the system of capitalism. Good. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, were you going to add something? No, yeah. Okay. Does this all add up so far? Do we think we have a good grasp on